I'm going to invite the first speaker, Dr. Makari, Professor of Surgery at Johns Hopkins and one of the national and international leaders on culture and safety in the operating room. Dr. Makari is going to talk about the culture of safety in the operating room, behavior, systems, and standardization. Dr. Makari, please. Well, thank you, Pascal, and I want to thank uh, Dan and uh, Ann for doing this session here. It's an important topic, and if it's okay, maybe we can talk at a higher level on quality and safety because uh, my suspicion is that this is a select audience and uh, you have an interest in the subject. Here are my disclosures. Um, if, if you have any other disclosures to give me, I'm, I'm open to receiving them. <laughs> um, I want to talk about what I think is the underlying problem of the entire healthcare system as the context for talking about um, addressing quality and safety. And the underlying problem, the problem that gets very little discussion in the soundbite grenades of healthcare reform, problem that gets very little attention to those that are not clinicians, is the problem of variation. It's actually endemic by definition if you use public health terminology. It's best encapsulated in the story of this man here, this is not my roommate in medical school, who I'll tell you about later. Um, this is uh, President Cleveland. Now, he was one of the most popular presidents ever elected at the time of his uh, presidency. Now, unfortunately, his term was cut short because he was shot at a railroad station on 7th Avenue in Washington, D.C., very close to the White House. And this crazy guy who shot him was arrested and they took the president back to the White House. The president had a, had a superficial wound in his back, he was a big guy, and the bullet lodged underneath the skin. Um, a fibrous sheath formed around the bullet, it sat in the subcutaneous fat, and over the next two months the doctors tried to decide what to do about the bullet. There were two entirely different schools of thought about what to do about this bullet. One group of doctors said, hey, we have Civil War experience, and you don't need to remove these bullets. You can leave them in. Another group of doctors, led by Dr. Bliss, said we must remove the bullet, and he fired the other doctors using the credential that he had been present when Lincoln was shot. And he began an expedition over the next two months to dig out the, dirt, the, bu the bullet with his dirty hands and instruments, along with seven other doctors under his direction. Well, the president died from a psoas muscle abscess on the contralateral side, nowhere near the gunshot wound or the bullet. The president died from a psoas muscle abscess, but essentially the president died of variation. He was a victim to the problem of variation. It turns out Lister, five years prior, had presented a theory of antisepsis at a national meeting. But the doctors, Dr. Bliss, said, if I can't save him, nobody can. It was a problem of a lack of humility. And many times, I think this story summarizes well the problem of the non-technical skills that impact patient care. We can master the technical skills of how to do a procedure, but the non-technical skills, humility, teamwork, coordination, catching patients that fall through the safety cracks in a hospital, engineering problems out of a hospital. These are the problems that are now the new frontier of a lot of the work that we're going to hear about in this session. Well, it turns out five years before uh, the president was shot, Lister had presented his data from the UK showing that the use of carboxylic acid, basically the same thing as Purell, and hand washing reduced mortality after any procedure from 47% to 15%. If ever there was a dramatic paper that launched the field of surgery, this was it. But yet it was not accepted. People said, first of all, you can't believe the data because it's from Europe. And second of all, they said, they don't have time. They're too busy to wash their hands. They're busy taking care of the patients. The non-technical skills. This problem of variation, in my opinion, is the underlying backbone problem that drives the cost crisis in America that drives the quality problem. Do you know that the average 
Braun's plan on the, on the Affordable Care Act Health Exchange has a deductible of $10,600. The average silver plan on the exchange, which is the most popular plan on the exchange, has an average deductible of $5,000. And while partisan folks would like to blame the other political party, the truth is that this just represents the natural maturation and continuation of health care price inflation over the last 30 years. And it's a problem, by, by and large, from the problem of variation, variation in quality. Now, this is our own NISQIP data. Within our own field, we know this problem is severe, just looking at our own risk-adjusted data using our definitions as surgeons. And you can see here some hospitals have complication rates after risk adjustment that are five or six times higher than other hospitals. Significant variation. The, of course, this comes at a tremendous toll, not, in, not only in terms of patient harm that's preventable, but in terms of cost. Of course, this audience is very familiar with this uh, aspect of variation. In my own field of laparoscopic pancreas surgery, somebody with a small tumor in the tail of the pancreas can present to two surgeons and get two radically different operations. Of course, one has markedly different outcomes compared to the other. Variation. If we've decided to graph every U.S. hospital in the national inpatient sample to ask how many of their standard colon operations are done minimally invasive. And here you can see that about, about one-sixth of U.S. hospitals do 100% of their colon operations open, and about one-third do more than 40% minimally invasive. Some may argue there's no data to support minimally invasive colon procedures. Well, there's actually not only a New England Journal randomized control trial that's 10 years old, but there's a Cochrane review of 25 other randomized control trials that supports superior outcomes, almost as if we're looking at the same data Lister presented. And it's not a, not a matter of not having appropriate data, it's a matter of not believing the data. Well, there's also variation in management. I get the privilege of visiting many hospitals around the country, and at some hospitals, they tell me the management is in touch with their patient safety needs and with the concerns of the physicians. And at other hospitals, tragically, they say, you know, we know how to make care better and safer at this hospital, but we don't feel that anybody's asking for our opinion. We, we don't feel that our input is solicited. And that's a dangerous trend. Here's two institutions, one with a leader who believed very much in being in touch with the front lines of his employees, that's Steve Jobs. And the other gentleman, if you recognize this man, Richard Fold, was sort of the icon of Wall Street in the worst sense. He was CEO of Lehman Brothers. Now, Lehman Brothers, if you know anything about the TARP bailout, was the only bank during the 2008 financial crisis that was not bailed out by the federal government. And when the TARP commission was asked, why did you bail out every bank but not Lehman Brothers? The answer by the TARP Commission was that it was gener generally recognized that Lehman Brothers had a poor workplace culture. Well, Mr. Fold was notorious. He had the elevator programmed to be only for him in one of the uh, shafts, and it was programmed so it never stopped at any other floor and went directly to his executive suite. His limo driver would call ahead to make sure the elevator was open and the lobby was cleared. In the words of one of his own vice presidents, Mr. Fold went out of his way to make sure that he never interacted with a single employee at Lehman Brothers. Many of you know Steve Jobs came to Johns Hopkins for some of his pancreas um, consultations, and he got to know one of my colleagues well, and my colleague went out to visit him and described the Apple headquarters as one that was uniquely designed to promote a great workplace culture. There was only one cafeteria by design. The employees all ate together at these open tables. Steve Jobs himself would sit down and ask some of the folks there, what are you working on? Tell me about your projects. What are your concerns? Of course, the workplace culture at Apple is generally recognized to be the model in any industry. In healthcare, we've measured workplace culture using the safety attitudes questionnaire. 
asking the questions, do you feel comfortable speaking up here if you perceive a problem? And would you go here for your own medical care? And in the 60 US hospitals that we studied, we found that there is, each bar is one hospital on this graph, that at some hospitals, 99% of the employees, the doctors and nurses, would go there for their own care. And at other, another hospital on the far left, only 17% would go there. Now, if you have to go to that hospital, I would run for your life. This demonstrates tremendous variation in the safety culture in US hospitals. And within our own profession, in the operating rooms, we also discovered, and this was a surprise to me, there's significant variation in the perceptions of teamwork within the same operating room. That is, we found that surgeons describe the teamwork to be excellent in the same room where the nurses describe it to be very poor. There's a massive disconnect among 52% of the nurses that replied to the survey in over 60 hospitals. We've correlated safety culture with outcomes, notably uh, PE and DVT, SSI, and postoperative sepsis. But what's interesting is that culture had no impact on postoperative hemorrhage. And we thought about this, and it actually made sense. Bleeding is not a team-related outcome. It's re the result of an individual surgeon's stitch. But infection prevention and blood clot prevention requires a huge series of events, deliveries, teamwork, calls, orders, uh, to get that prophylaxis administered. Well, the Department of Health and Human Services recently announced a rule that they want every hospital to have one doctor on their board. This came in response to organizations in medicine that said, you know, medicine is now being taken over by non-physicians, and we don't f feel that we have a voice in the quality of our institution. So I was pretty impressed. I noticed that Kathleen Sebelius had made this announcement saying that a physician who represents the staff will serve on the governing body of every hospital in America, just one doctor for every hospital board in America. Well, I was surprised to see that this was later um, overturned by the lobbying efforts of one organization, the American Hospital Association, and they boasted about it on their website. But this increasing divide is our, it, it is our challenge in healthcare reform. I want to go over a few briefly in the next two minutes here, some tools that are designed to address this great divide and, and to address the barriers in quality. One is the CUSP program, or the Comprehensive Unit-Based Safety Program. There are many programs with different names that do the same thing, Lean Sigma, small groups that have met on safety for years. This is just one format for it that we've described in the literature, but it brings together hospital administrators, doctors, nurses, and techs around a service line and talks about safety, specifically one barrier to safety. And we found that um, clinicians find this to be a time to bridge the divide between management and frontline personnel. We try to move beyond the idea of just using a surgical checklist. I can't tell you the number of CEOs that will come up to me and say, you know, we've downloaded the surgery checklist from the WHO website, but we haven't noticed any change in retained foreign bodies. Well, that's because it's obvious to us checklists require a culture, a culture of safety, and you can't just download safety. Matter of fact, we began referring to them as briefings in the early publications and have come back to that term because we want to promote the idea of a discussion. And the most important item in this briefing is really introducing the names and roles of the members of the team. You know, anonymity promotes disruptive behavior. All you have to do is look at your own email. People will say things far more aggressive or vulgar on email than they will ever, ever say to your face, and that's because there's anonymity. And the same is true in the operating room. We're even wearing masks and sometimes don't even know the names of the people we need to work closely with. And taking a moment to just go over the names and roles of every member of the team establishes uh, everyone's responsibility, and we found that it improves patient safety culture in this particular study looking at the perception of patient safety. We also found that it reduces unnecessary delays in the operating room. Finally, the global trigger tool is an emerging tool that identifies problems that live within hospital data in real time to enable a hospital to send a rapid response team. 
So if two of these items in this global trigger tool paper are identified as occurring in real time, something bad is really about to happen. And for example, if you, ha if you have somebody that has an unplanned x-ray and a consult or a stat lab in the recovery room, those two things together by re regression analysis means that the risk of some catastrophic event is so great that it's actually worth sending a rapid response team before somebody is paged or bumps up a concern to a higher person. The global trigger tool, I think, is a real promising area right now. Uh, video review. Uh, if a video is reviewed by an, a peer that's independent, not a peer that's competing with you in your practice, there can be tremendous impacts on quality. Uh, I wrote an article in JAMA that was coupled with an article in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at the impact of potential peer-based, non-punitive uh, video review. And it's really based on the experience that independent review of videos predicts outcome. And there's been several experiences, of which I'll just cite this one, where video review or uh, on-site real-time coaching by a senior mentor resulted in improved outcomes and it resulted in better satisfaction among the surgeons. That is, 100% of the surgeons that participated in the program are glad that they did and they believe that it resulted in them performing better. So with that, I just want to say thank you and I look forward to the discussion and thank you for holding this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. McCowry.